mind, remembering times long ago. And uh, I used to sing this little song uh, when I first got saved. I don't know who wrote it, where it come from. It's not really a, what you'd think it was a great song, but it's a good little song. And it talks about the change in you when you get saved. I think a lot of people, as years go by, start just taking for granted being saved. That's right. So they want something else, something else. Entertain me, thrill me, make me laugh, make me feel good. And, and you know what? You don't ever get over just being saved. Amen. Remember the change in your life when you got saved? Remember how your friends thought you'd lost your mind? I mean, remember them? I mean, if they didn't, there's something wrong with your conversion. Amen. That's what they said about Paul. They said, much learning doth make you mad. And they weren't talking about being angry. They were talking about being crazy. So uh, the name of this little song, if I can do it tonight morning, I had like 100 years till just a few months ago here at the church, and it's called uh, I Found a Better Way. And I know, I hope it'll be a blessing. Maybe you can, I ain't got a pick, but I'll just try it. Oh, don't look for me to be just like I used to be. There's been a change in me. I found a better way. Oh, don't look for me to say some things I used to say before. I don't say them anymore. I found a better way. Well, I found a better way, brighter path for my feet. My heart of joy so sweet, I found a better way. And since I found the church, and I found a place to pray, and there I found the Lord, I found a better way. Oh, don't look for me to go where I used to go before. I don't go there anymore. I found a better way. Amen. Well, I may not walk so proud, and I may not boast so loud, but I'm bound for heaven now. I found a better way. I found a better way, brighter path for my feet. My heart of joy is so sweet. I found a better way. And since I found the church, and I found a place to pray, and there I found the Lord, I found a better way. And since I found the church, and I found a place to pray, and there I found the Lord, I found a better way. Amen. Amen, Frankie. You better say amen right there. I woke up this morning, 6 o'clock, and he's laying right up against me like this. And I said, if I move, I'm going to wake him up. And then and he's going to wake all of us up. So I just laid there for a while and tried to pray. But uh, yeah, I'll get him after a while. Amen. All right. Let's open our Bibles now to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to take just a few minutes here this morning and uh, say once again, thank you for being here. All of our guests, visitors, uh, appreciate this. It's in, I'm, I, don't, I don't take stuff like that real good. It's, um, it's embarrassing to me, really. Uh, so, but anyway, I appreciate our church and all y'all do for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to preach this morning on a few things that I've learned as a pastor. A few things that I have learned being a pastor. I have been pastoring over 40 years. Um, you can't do something that long and not learn something. And the Apostle Paul here was giving a little bit of his testimony, saying some things that he had been through to this Corinthian church. Now, some of these things I haven't been through, maybe spiritually, but not physically like he was, such as verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, I can relate to that. In perils of water, yes, 
In perils of robbers, yes. In perils of my own countrymen, yes. In perils of the heathen, yes. In perils in the city, yes. In perils in the wilderness, yes. In perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And this is the way a preacher should feel about his church. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. Paul said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna glory about the great things I've done. There ain't none. I'm going to glory about my sufferings, my persecutions, and my battles. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. I want to preach for a few minutes this morning on just a few things that I have learned as a pastor. Many times people ask me, what, what's it, what, is, what is it like being a pastor? How do you know you're supposed to be a pastor? How, how, does it, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I get asked that regularly. And a lot of the, I don't know the answer to a lot of that. I know one thing. You don't choose the ministry. You are chosen for the ministry. It's not a vocation you decide to by help with your guidance counselor. It is a calling from God to the ministry. Now, I'd like to just say a few things, maybe something I haven't told you all before. First of all, I'd like to say you never regret going for the Lord. You hear me? You never regret going for the Lord. I regret a lot of things in my life, but I don't regret one mile that I've traveled for the Lord. Anything I've ever done for God sincerely from my heart, I do not regret it. I'm telling you, the best way to spend your life, people, is do stuff for, the, for other people in the Lord. When you look back, you won't, you won't regret it. If I had to leave this world today, I could be, I'd regret a lot of things that I've done, but I don't regret one thing Amen. that I've ever done Amen. for the glory of God. Amen. I don't regret going up that mountain, Highway 80 in Marion, up there going toward Mount Mitchell, to that little bitty church, Sunnyvale Baptist Church, uh, my, so my, my sister's here this morning Debbie remember Carrie don't remember this uh, as much she was just little but I remember going up that road my sister Sandy she called she said Danny we want you to come and preach a revival I think I was oh Lord I don't know I was 20 I don't know 21 21 years old she said we want you to preach a revival our young people's full of the devil and, uh, and I prayed, and I said, well, what does your pastor want? He's the man, you know, he's supposed to do this. She said, uh, he wants you to. And I said, well, tell him to call me. And we talked a little bit, and I went up there, and I preached, winding up that little road. And that, that's the revival that got on. I'm telling you, it got good. And Brother Gene Googe is standing over yonder preaching this morning because he got saved in that revival meeting. I don't regret that. I don't regret that. I don't regret giving up my evening to drive up there and preach that day. Well, what if it was one of the kids' birthday? Went anyway. What if it was grandma's uh, birthday? Went anyway. I don't regret one mile I've traveled for the Lord. I'll never regret driving over to Robbinsville, North Carolina back during the, the late 80s. And I'll never, I'll never regret going over there that day I remember it was pouring the rain and I was so tired and I was so hurting. I was crying while I was dry, trying to drive. I'll never forget pulled in this little old store. It was foggy. Have you ever drove, have you ever drove from Asheville to, to, uh, to the gorge, toward Cherokee? I mean, through the mountains, not going up the interstate. Lord in mercy. I mean, there's nothing but fog. You couldn't see. And I drove, I drove over there in this little store and I pulled in there and put my head down just for a minute. And the devil said, you are crazy. 
You, ever, you, you got a million things at home. I was hurting. I was going through a hard time in my life. I, I, I ain't got time to tell you the whole story, but I wound up going over there and preaching the first night. Uh, the, the people got right with the Lord. The next night, people got right with the Lord. Then it just started, just blew up. And se- uh, 21 nights later, and 75 people saved, and a public school being shook, I I went back home uh, after several trips to that revival. We was going over there, she does remember that. She'd get home from school at at 10 minutes to four. By five after four, we was leaving to go to the revival. She got home at five after four, we drove three hours to church, had church, drove three hours home, got home at one or two o'clock in the morning, she got up and went to school, come home the next day and did it again. And it, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. And, and I'm telling you, she never done her homework, but she's alive and well, amen. Uh, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. She got it done in her, I made her do it in the car. I made her do it, I said, do it before you get home. Uh, do it Do it somehow. And But that revival, God was moving. Listen, buddy, if you can ever get your kids in a real honest to goodness revival, a Holy Ghost move of God, it's worth whatever you gotta do to get them in it. And I'm telling you, we had it. I don't regret that. I don't regret that little uh, church in, in North Cove, when I remember one day it was snowed, it snowed all day long. Lord, it snowed. I mean, it was that deep and pouring the snow and it started getting dark and I was preaching revival up above North Cove, going toward Linville, Linville Falls, up, up 221. Uh, if y'all are not in McDowell County, uh, Marion Main Street is 221, just keep going. And I'd go way up there and preach and of course, every time it got bad weather, my phone would ring. I'd pick it up, hello, I knew it was, it was mom. Mom would say, Danny, now son, you are not going to go up there in this weather. And I, I said, mom, you know I'm going to go. She said, son, you can't do it. Now them people don't expect you to do that. I, I said, mom, you know I'm going to, and I didn't want to be rude. I did, I did not want to be disrespectful. She done me that way every time it snowed, every time. And, and, I, and I know she meant well and everything, but uh, tell, telling me that I'm not going to go to church when I'm supposed to preach, you might as well tell that microphone to uh, swim across Lake James. I mean, I mean, you're just wasting, if I can, I am by God's grace. If I can't, I can't, but if I can, I will. And, my, and and me and um, my cousin Joey uh, got in a, in a little Volkswagen and drove up to that revival. And I'm telling you, it was awful. T- to be honest with you, it wasn't that I was so spiritual. I was looking for excuse to get out and drive in the snow. That's that's really the honest truth. It's about high spirit and high. I want to have fun in that snow. And that little thing was front wheel drive, you know, and we went good up through there, and there was about eight, eight or ten people there. And I got in there that night, and the, the devil said, see, you're wasting your time, risk your life. Uh, you can stay at home and make snow cream and all that. And the power of God hit that place, and the Holy Ghost moved in that little church. I, I hadn't been in such a service. That was one of the best services I've ever been in. And there wasn't ten people there. Somebody up here started shouting. Somebody over here started shouting shouting, we had the awfulest time ever was. I don't regret stuff like that. I don't regret one mile. I, I tell you one, I remember one time, I mean one time some funny stuff happened, some funny stuff happened. Me and these boys, I had another Volkswagen. I paid $700 for a, a little old Volkswagen, a little red Volkswagen, and it was before, it was the old Volkswagen body style, before the new newer ones even come out. And uh, that thing was several several years old, and uh, I remember it had one of them, the sunroof, you, you cranked them kind of like that. Anybody don't remember them kind of sunroof you cranked open? Well, I had that little old thing, and uh, I, I was preaching way up in the mountains in Burnsville, North Carolina, way up yonder, toward Mount Mitchell. And three guys went with me. I had one here and two in the back seat. We drove up there to that revival, and I preached that night. We was coming back down from Burnsville toward, from Bur- toward Spruce Pine, and up in there in the middle, out in the middle of nowhere, some little old country road. And about that time, the gas feed went right to the floor. I went, uh-oh. And it was like it was, it was idling. The car was idling, but the gas just went to the floor. You couldn't, it, it wouldn't do nothing. So I got up, pulled over, over in the grass. I said, boy, we got car trouble. And you know, we didn't, there was, that was, but there was no cell phones. There was no houses. We was out there. You know, so we got out there and got fooling around and, um, and, and got in there and op- the, the motor's in the back. You remember the old Volkswagen had the motor in the back? And I lifted up that thing 
and it looked, one of them finally said, there's what's wrong, Brother Danny. said, your gas cable's broke. And sure enough, the gas cable had a little thing there. It pulled like a lawnmower. And every time you give it to gas, it'd pull that little thing up like that. And it had broke somewhere in there and wasn't doing nothing. I said, now what are we going to do? They said, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't have nobody to call. Didn't have, there wasn't no house. I didn't even know where the nearest house was. I mean, back then, you know, if you broke down, you stuck. You stuck. You might be there all night. And uh, it ain't like it is nowadays. Uh, but anyway, we, we stood there and I, and I said, well, there, there really ain't nothing wrong with it. It just can't. And you, take, you could take your finger and go, ring, ring, ring. So I had this bright idea. I, I said, I know what let's do. I said, uh, give me your belts. Everybody took off their belt. We took our belt and hooked them together. And I tied that, tied that belt, this is no lie, onto that gas feed and run it across the top of the car. And I took this boy beside me and I said, now when I tell you, you yank on it like that and that'll give it the gas. Now we're up in the mountain. It's pitch dark, 12 o'clock at night. And it's a little, it's, I was going to change the gears because I had the clutch here and the gear shift here. And, and, and I... And, and we got in, I said, now, now you practice a time or two. He went, vroom, vroom. He had his hand out the window like this over top of that car, and he's jerking it like that. And uh, I, I remember I said, uh, all right, all right, I've, I've got it in gear. Are you ready? And he said, okay. I said, now I'm going to let the clutch out, and you guys, go ahead. And he went, vroom, he took off like that. I said, whoa, not that hard. So I let off, I said, a little bit hard. No, not that hard. And we went down the road, me trying to change gears in that thing. I'm talking, brother, have you ever come down Cox's Creek up from Little Switzerland, uh, down from, uh, 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 it's awful. It's awful in a brand new car. I mean, it's just like this and straight down. We drove 30 miles. Now, stop, stop sign, fool. Stop, let go of it. That's what I was saying. I say, whoa. And, and then take off and then go, Ree! and then I put in your, wow, like that right there. And we come all the way from there to Marion, like that. Sure did. Sure did. I, I, my mom would have died if she had known that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I don't regret those times. I don't regret. I don't regret going to one revival. I don't regret one time falling on my knees. Every minute I, I regret some times I've wasted. I don't regret one time I've hit my... Does anybody in here regret times that you've prayed and so No, you don't regret that. You say, I'm glad I did that. You want to be able to look back on life without regrets one day? Quit spending all your life and time on yourself and your interests and do it for the Lord and you look back and say, I don't regret a mile. I've traveled for the Lord. Number two, you know what I've learned? You cannot depend on people to sustain you. If you're depending on other people to keep you going, you ain't gonna last very long. I ain't come a time in my ministry when I found out, you know what, if I'm gonna make this, it's gonna have to be me and you, Lord, and you're gonna have to help me because I can't depend. As a matter of fact, you can't depend on people, period. People are, are, are flesh. We're all flesh. People will let you down. I've heard people say, well, Brother Danny, uh, I, you know, and, and sometimes preachers do this. We, we come to church to get our battery charged. People say that. They say, well, I come to get my battery charged. And in a sense, that's true. We all come in here this morning, get your spiritual battery charged, and you're ready to go out and serve the Lord. But guess what? In this, in this work that I do, I found out that I have to get my own motor running, that I have to get my own batteries, keep my own battery charged. I, I, I can come in here on Sunday morning and jump y'all off. I can come in here this morning, if you're barely moving, I can hook the jumper cables up to you. We can pray, the choir can sing, I can preach. We can pray, and man, you're ready to go out here. But when I'm, I'm on empty and my battery's dead, I can't, well, Lord, if I come in here and depend on y'all uh, to cheer me, whoo, Lord, I commit suicide sometimes. And, and, but I, I've, got to, I've learned that you cannot depend on people to sustain you. If your battery is dead, brother, just learn how to get it from the Lord learn how to get it from God uh, because people are fickle. People will be there one day and gone the next. I had a preacher come to me one time uh, years ago and he was all, he was one of these real spiritual guys and I don't mean it bad, but this guy come to me and he was all spiritual and had his Bible right here. I was getting ready to go off and preach somewhere on a trip. He said, Brother Danny, he said, if, if you need anything done while you're gone, I just want you to know I'm here to help you. And I'd heard that so much that I about got tired of it and I might not have should have said it. 
But I'd said that over and over and over. And I said, brother, you can help me. He said, how's that? I said, you can help these folks visit Thursday night and knock on some doors. He never said one word and never did go. He wasn't wanting to help me. He's wanting to be in the spotlight while I was gone. I've learned you can't depend on people to keep you going. Number three, listen to this. I've learned that you grow more in hard times than in good times. Buddy, that's the truth, that's the truth, that's the truth. Amen, nobody likes being put on the ironing board. Nobody likes being thrown in the refiner's fire. If you're a piece of gold with junk on you and they throw you in the fire, it hurts. Burning hurts, burning hurts. But I tell you, it'll get rid of the dross, it'll get rid of the, the, the junk that's in your life. Listen, if God, if, if God's ever gonna use you, if God's ever gonna use you, you're gonna have to hurt. You're gonna have to suffer. You're gonna have to go through some heartache. It, there is no other way out. Somebody asked me not long ago, they said, Brother Danny, what do you think is wrong with this newer generation of preachers, younger generation of preachers coming up? And uh, I said, you know, I don't know. I mean, they're smart, they're intelligent, they're talented, but they, they sort of they lack something that that old last generation of preachers had. And, and what is that? And I'll tell you what it is. They've had it made their whole life and never been through trouble. And it's not their fault. But if God's ever going to use you, God came to me one time, he said, Brother Danny, how did you learn what you've learned? I said, well, you know, let me think about that. He said, you never went to Bible college. I said, no, I'm not bragging about that. I've never been to Bible college, day in my life. I always figured I've got the same brain they got, if they can learn it, I can. And I remember thinking, I told him this. I said something like this. He said, how did you get the word that you know what you're doing in the ministry? And I said, try this. Try your preaching revival in Charlotte. And it's a two-hour drive back then. And you ain't got no gas. And you ain't got no money. And it's 18 degrees outside and the pipes underneath your house is busted. There ain't no water. You got a three-year-old with no water. Can't take a shower, and the pipes is busted. We had that little old house over in Nebo, and I have, I have had, uh, uh, you ever, some of y'all have never done this. You ever had to hang a blanket across the kitchen and stuff so the rest of the house would stay a little bit warm for the kids? How many of you ever had to do that right now? These kids don't even know nothing about that nowadays because they got vents in every room. Back then we had a Siegler oil, a Siegler oil stove, the little Siegler. And I had that thing on, and I hung that blanket up there and went in the kitchen in the morning, and there was ice in the kitchen sink, buddy, inside the house. That's cold, brother. And I'm telling you, I remember laying, getting in the floor and praying and putting my feet up against the blower of that little oil stove because my feet was freezing. And my van wouldn't start, and we had to push it off. And there was ice, and I went over, my uncle lived across the road and borrowed $3 for gas to drive that van to Charlotte to preach. Amen. I didn't say, pipes is froze, can't come. Can't take a shower, can't have a shower, no way. Can't take a bath, can't come. Got no gas, can't come. Got no money, can't come. I said, do that. And then I remember going one time in, in Marion and I had the flu. And I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you, this is school. That's what I told this guy. That's school. You'll learn something pushing your car off, having to borrow money for gas, and freezing your hands off that you don't learn, learn sitting behind a desk. Amen. And I remember, I remember going to preach in Black Mountain and I had the flu. And these boys was going with me and I was shaking. You know how when you're the flu, you, I guess you got a fever because you, you're freezing, you can't get warm. You ever been that way? You cannot get warm. You can put every blanket in the house on, you can't get warm. I turned the heat on high. I turned around and I was driving up Black Mountain going like this. And they said, well, I'm burning up. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm freezing to death. And I was shaking. And finally, uh, my throat was hurting and I had the flu. And I got up that night 
And I thought, well, I'm going to try this. And I started preaching, and I felt like the Lord healed me. I felt great. I said, whoo, the Lord hit me. As soon as I got done, bam, it hit me again. Maybe it healed me for a few minutes. I don't know. I said, that's school. That's school. Sleeping in your car. You have to go somewhere to preach. That's school. When you go to town, somebody runs up to you and, and, and says, you know what? My daddy said he's going to come kill you. My phone rings. This woman said, this Danny Castle? I said, yes, it is. She said, well, I'm a witch and I'm going to put a hex on you. I said, you ain't done it. You can't put no hex on me. She said, yes, I can. I said, you, you, you said her aunt was. I said, tell her to bring it on. She ain't going to put no curse on me. I'm under the blood of Jesus, man. That the devil, God, the devil can't do nothing with us. The Lord don't let him. They come in one day and they said, Brother Danny, they spray painted your name on the ice over at the lake in big letters and said some bad stuff about me and sprayed on my office door some other bad stuff. I remember driving all the way to Florence, South Carolina. Back then, almost six hours, I went right before you get to the beach. And I preached on music. They wanted me, somebody set me up there. I, and I didn't know what I was getting into. A big, large youth group, about church about the size of this. And I got up there and I preached that rock music thing. And buddy, they got mad. They crowded around. The whole group crowded around me after service and started pointing their finger and said, you have no right to judge. And the woman, youth director, she said, you are judging people. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. And the pastor never even spoke to me. Never even spoke to me when that thing was over. I got my car and turned around and come back home. That's school. That's school. That's what, you know what? We got a generation of preachers that think, I don't go nowhere unless I get a five-star motel. And I don't go nowhere unless I get a thousand dollar offer. That's a that's that's as far away from a Bible ministry as you can possibly get. God ain't a million mile of a bunch of junk. Paul said, A night and a day I've been in the deep. Perils in the heathen, perils in the wilderness, perils in the country. It ain't that you like it, but if that's what God's got for you, deal with it, brother. That'll make a preacher out of you. So I thought that'll make a preacher out of you. Somebody call. I'm gonna come over and burn your house down. I said, No, you're not. I hope you don't. That's what I said in my mind. <laughs> but I always try to stand up to him, and he didn't. That boy got killed. That's told me that. Threatened, threatened that. Next. Let me just say this. There's, I could talk all day on what I just got through talking about. That, that's to me, that's education. Traveling. And trouble, and I'm left out the bad stuff. I mean, if I want you want to sing a sob story, we all could here this morning. And I ain't got no sad sob story. God's been good to me. Amen. God's been good to me. Next, I want to say this: never take for granted that everything's all right. If you if you ever think everything's going good, you have obviously overlooked something bad. Everything ain't never good. Everything is never good in this world. Other people say, everything's great. Everything, well, you're crazy or you're, you got to hold some bad dope or something. Or you, you're just not looking, brother. Everything ain't never good. I have always somebody mad. There's always somebody upset about something. There's always somebody ready to quit. And no matter how, listen, I've had hundreds of people quit and go to other churches since I've been pastoring and it still hurts the same now as it did the first time. It hurts your stomach. It hurts your gut. So I'm like, oh, I don't see them two or three weeks. Where's so-and-so? Oh, they started going somewhere else. I thought, what? They didn't even tell me? Didn't even call me and sit down and say, thank you for burying my families and marrying my kids and, and preaching my son. Goes, what in the world? Man, you talk about hurt. That hurts, brother. You, nobody knows how that hurts. So I said, you invest your life and heart into people and then they'll just stab you right in the back. That hurts. Never take for granted that everything's okay. We can all come in here this morning and everybody smile and everything. You think, wow, everybody's doing great. Everybody ain't doing great. They ain't. You can forget that. You can forget that. You say, well, that's negative. Y'all you know, 
I know, sure is. That's the power of negative thinking. You need more of it and to make it through this world, brother. You gotta realize there's nothing in this world that's perfect except that book right there. Your home's not perfect, your church ain't perfect, your preacher ain't perfect, your, your wife ain't perfect, your kids ain't perfect. Nothing in this world is perfect but this book. Amen. And everything else, you're gonna have to learn to bend with it a little bit as you go through. And the last thing I'll say this morning and I'll be through is why do you keep going? Why? Now, I ask I people all the time, say, I, you, I, they say, you're the energizer bunny. I, you just keep going. I don't ask them how. I ask why. Why you keep going? Why you keep going? And I'll tell you why I keep going. I'll tell you why I keep doing this. The reason I keep doing what I'm doing is I believe really deep down in my heart there's a heaven and hell. And I believe everybody here is going to one of them two places. And I believe you're gonna be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I believe this life is short and there could be people sitting in here today. Maybe you've been to church. Maybe you got made a little profession in Bible school when you was little or maybe you uh, made a, signed a card or something and never really got saved. By the grace of God, that drives me, brother. That, every time I think about just pulling back a little bit, something that says, what about souls? What about somebody going to hell? That's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us going. Listen, brother, listen. You don't preach for a paycheck. If a preacher preaches for a paycheck, he's a hireling. You don't preach for money. You preach for God and for people to get saved. That's why you ought to start out preaching on the street and keep preaching on the street. Every preacher in the Bible is a street preacher, including Jesus, including Jesus, out in the wide open. And I had people I went to high school grab around me one night and point their finger and laugh at me. They laughed at me. And I've lived long enough now, some of them, I guess some of them not even here no more, not even alive. If there was no hell, the urgency would, would definitely, my goodness, if there's no hell, just do what you want to. If you want to go to heaven, all right. If you don't, all right. But there's a hell. Below your feet this morning, there's a blistering inferno. You wouldn't think it, would you? If, if the world, you know when you dig a hole, it keeps getting colder and colder the deeper you dig? You'd think the center, but science has proved now, the, the, and it's obvious, the center of the earth's on fire. There's fire down there. There's fire down there, people. There's fire and there's a hell. There's a hell where you go when you die. There's a hell that you go to and you scream and you beg God for a drop of water on your tongue and you say, please, Lord, please, God, please, God, and you don't never get out. I was going there. I was on my way there. And thank God I went to a revival one night and there's an old man of God there who prayed. And I ain't never forgot that. I've never forgot that. There's another little Danny sitting in here this morning. There's another little Jimmy here this morning. There's another little Jason here this morning. There's another uh, uh, Miss Pe little Peanut here sitting here this morning. There's somebody here today that was in the same shape I was in when before I got saved. And that's what keeps us going, people. That's what keeps us going. There's a hell. That's why we run in buses. That's why we run the buses. That's why we support missionaries. That's what keeps you going. That's what keeps you going. That's some things I've learned in the ministry. Let's stand by our heads for prayer, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed.